Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to be doing part two of a sculpt along on how to sculpt a clay foot. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. I'm gonna take a closer survey of the sculpture. And in fact, I'm gonna get really far back and look at it from a distance because I'm looking at the sculpture with a set of fresh eyes. And that's one of the advantages when you come back to a piece is being able to see things about it that maybe were not so clear before. I think I really need to work on this view because this is the view that I think looks the most flat. And by the way, if you want to paint or draw along with me, you do not have to sculpt and you wanna practice drawing feet, I would love it for all of you to go down to the video description below. You can get access to the free reference photos so we can work together. All right. I think I need to bulk this up. Let's just start there and tell me in the chat who here is going to draw, who here is going to sculpt. Is anybody here working on the same sculpture from last time or are you going to start something new? Just what's going on? Or if you're just going to do something else, it's totally cool. If you want to just hang with us in the studio, that is just as valid in my opinion. By the way, tell me in the chat, how many people listen to us in the studio when you're making work? I know a lot of you do, but a lot of people tell me that it helps them stay a little bit distracted, not so much that you can't do the work, but it's nice to feel that you're not totally by yourself when you're in the studio. It gets lonely. Anybody else feel that way? I do think being an artist, it's an inherently lonely profession. I mean, <laughs> you have to spend a lot of time <clears throat> making work and oftentimes it does not involve a group of people unless you're in art school. And even then, even in art school, I know for a lot of people, sometimes being around all the people, it's distracting. So it's it's hard because it's like, you wanna be around people, but you don't. <laughs> I guess it's kind of like the pandemic. Now that some places are beginning to open up, I know some people are having a lot of anxiety about going back to in person. I mean, it depends on who you are, obviously, but if you're somebody, if you have social anxiety or if you just struggle in social situations, I could see how the not having to go to parties all the time, not like I was ever being invited to that many. <laughs> I hate parties. That's my confession. I know parties are supposed to be fun, but I hate them. <laughs> They're so awkward. Like I never know <laughs> what I'm supposed to do. And it's so embarrassing because you feel like an idiot. And then when somebody calls you out for feeling like an idiot or notices that you feel like an idiot, it's just worse. Like I was at this printmaking meeting. It's me and a bunch of dirty printmakers. It's great. And I think it was just before the meeting was going to start. And it's that awkward moment where you're just noshing on carrots and all that stuff, which I'm cool with. But I didn't have anyone to talk to for like a minute. And this one person comes up to me. He's like, you look lost. I'm like, thanks, dude. I didn't already feel awkward enough that really... It really helped, helped make me feel even more awkward. So yeah, not, not fun, not my cup of tea. 
something's wonky with this toe. I can't figure, see, it looks fine. It's gonna be a lot of squinting today and a lot of leaning back. I can't figure out if this metatarsal isn't enough to the right. Maybe if I bulk up this metatarsal, I don't know. It's like the metatarsal is too small and therefore the big toe is too big. This is where you really have to compare. Lulu Bell says, probably I can enjoy the solitude because I have a huge family and friends and I know are there if I want company. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Yuki's asking, how does the foot stick to the wood? Does the clay do that by itself? It does. The clay that I am using today, <coughs> excuse me, got a bunch of frogs in my throat this morning. This is mystery clay. I'm sorry to tell you, but I, honestly do not know what brand this clay is because I taught a workshop and the people at the workshop, I just said to them, buy me some oil-based modeling clay. And so they bought it for me and I have no idea where they got it, but it's basically Plasiline. I mean, the Plasiline that I recommend is called Van Aken Protolina Clay. And if you want information on all the tools that I'm using in the stream, those are in the YouTube video description below. But what's really nice about this oil-based clay is that it's a pretty strong clay. So as long as you pinch it and make it dense and there aren't a bunch of air pockets and stuff, you can just stick it on. I mean, it's fabulous. That's another reason I like it. Another reason I can get away with that is because it's such a flat sculpture. It's not like I'm doing somebody with their arms extending outward. So if you have a sculpture that's not that dimensional or dramatic, you can usually get away without an armature. And another thing that's also very helpful is scale. So most sculptures, once you get to a certain scale, you have to have some sort of armature or structure holding it up. For example, These are these little air dry clay heads. And I don't know, sometimes it's really fun to make tiny sculpture because it's so flexible. Like you don't have to worry about anything falling over and it's just so easy to throw together. Whereas if you're making a sculpture with their arms raised, I mean, that's all kinds of structural issues. And so sculpture does get, pretty complicated pretty fast and that's a good thing to be aware of yuki is saying will you end up making the foot smooth or will you leave it rough like this well i actually asked a bunch of people on youtube community tab and a lot of people told me they wanted to see it smooth that's not my stylistic preference in general, I do tend to like things that are a little bit more gestural, but if all of you think that that would be an interesting technique for you to see, tell me, and I can certainly do that because you know something, the streams are not about me, okay? <laughs> if they were about me, we would not be drawing Steve Buscemi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, although that was a really fun stream. I had a great time, but it's just not what I typically do. Anyway, if anybody here feels that seeing this brought to a more smooth completion would be helpful for you, tell me. Because I can. I can do that if I want to, but it's a, it's a choice. You have to decide that that's what you want to do. It does take way longer because there's just a lot to articulate. But let me know. And oftentimes I won't finish the whole thing on the stream, but I'll do 75% on the stream. And then sometimes I'll finish it off the stream and then you can see the final result, but not have to sit through, you know, three hours of me just like blending with the tool, which can get pretty boring pretty fast. 
I need my ribbon tool. Hang on. This is a really fun tool. It's just a little loop on the end. And typically people use it for ceramics, but totally you can use it for plastiline clay as well, which is oil-based. That's what I'm using today. And I do find it easier to sculpt reductively. Sometimes people think, oh, because it's clay, it's all about adding. But I find carving much easier. You have a lot more control over the form. It's just a lot more friendly. And your tool can go places that your hand can't. The tool has a flexibility because of its shape. And your fingers are very klutzy by comparison as far as where they can travel to, like all these nooks and crannies that you just can't reach with your fingers. I think I'm not exaggerating enough. It, it feels very understated to me right now. I'm getting to that plateau. You know that point in a drawing or an artwork and you're like, I know it's not done, but it still doesn't look great. But it's becoming less and less clear what I need to do. Because in the beginning of a sculpture, it's like, duh, yeah, I need to make a toe. <laughs> it doesn't work if I don't have a toe. But I have toes now, but what do I do with them? I do think the heel could get bulked up as well. So what I'm going to try to do today, I'm going to try to, for lack of a better word, over sculpt. I'm going to make forms bigger and bulgier than I think they should be. And they might end up just about right because I think I do have a tendency to underestimate how much form there is. And so sometimes by adding what I think is too much, sometimes you end up just adding <laughs> just the right amount. It's funny the way that that works. Yeah, I think I got to come around to this view because I'm not really sure what's going on there with the heel. MJ says, I end up watching your videos for hours on end while working on artwork. Art cross videos make me feel as though I'm working beside you and I find that motivates me. Oh, I need the motivation as much as all of you do because I'll be honest, if I wasn't doing these live streams, I don't know that I would be making this much work. And a lot of it is just the responsibility of showing up because it's hard to get yourself to get up and do it when there's always another reason why there's something else you should be doing. And it's easy to be pulled by that. But sometimes you just have to put down all the stuff that you quote should be doing and you just make artwork. Sometimes that's just what has to happen. Thornton Lee says, I could see answering the quote, is it done question would be even harder in sculpture and clay. It is because I think that with sculpture, you have to ask yourself, what are you really trying to do? Because in theory, and I know people who can do this way better and faster than me, you can just take the reference photos, which you can get in the video description below, and you can just say, okay, Am I replicating the photo precisely? You can totally do that. And for some people that is their goal maybe. Oh, I got this blue paint last time because of my stupid modeling tools. <laughs> I had paint, so I'm not gonna take that off. Anyway, there goes my Achilles tendon. Let's add a little bit more. <laughs> but with sculpture, you have to say, okay, well, if I'm not trying to just make a 3D version that's accurate to the reference photo, what am I trying to do? What am I after? And that's where a lot of these questions, they get more complicated. And you got to start asking yourself, what am I really after here? And then you're balancing all the technical stuff, of course, at the same time. So what I just did, I was just looking at the height 
of the lateral malleolus. And then I came back here to carve on this side. So it's funny because sometimes you'll look at one view and think, okay, I got to fix that. But to actually fix it, you have to rotate here to do it. So this is where the jumping around, the constant rotating, very, very important in sculpture. You guys aren't gonna see much of my face today. I'm gonna be squinting and standing back. Okay, my Achilles tendon is really stiff. So I'm gonna to try to get in there and make it bulgier. Like I said, over sculpting the form. Okay. W315 says, there's no end to laundry. Sometimes it just has to wait. I know. And sometimes I'm at home and I just think to myself, oh, you're home. You might as well just get ahead on your chores. There's no such thing as a head because chores never end. <laughs> they just keep going. And so it's silly to say, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to put off my painting so I can get ahead with the dishes when really you're still doing dishes later. So yeah, sometimes it's just a decision like, yep, screw those dishes and let's just work and not think about it. Another thing I'm noticing, the Achilles tendon, okay? This is a good thing to consider. Think about in the form, and this goes for drawing too. This is not isolated to sculpture. Ask yourself, where is the tension? So if I look at the Achilles tendon, this is the tension. This is the part of the Achilles tendon that feels tight, okay? Now on the heel, it does feel hard but hard is not the same thing as tight. And that's where you need to differentiate things. So up here, I'm gonna build up the form of the heel, but I'm gonna soften the transition up here at the top so that this can feel the most taut. And a lot of sculpture is like that. You wanna make one thing smooth, make the thing next to it rough. We talked about that, we had a stream Kat and I were talking about texture in 3D artwork. And that is very common to make something soft, put something hard next to it. That can be very effective in terms of pumping up the section you're working on. Oftentimes it's easy to say, well, I don't like this part. I want to fix this. But sometimes you really do have to fix something else to change the dynamic of what that other thing is doing. So it's it feels sort of indirect because it's like, well, yeah, I'm gonna work on this thing to make this thing different. And that's where trying to be very holistic about your work is very important. Tell me in the chat, who here wants to see a full out smooth sculpture? And who here wants something a little bit more expressionistic? I'm going to veer towards smooth because I have done already a lot of expressionistic looking work. And so I think just for variety's sake, it probably is smarter for me to demo something that we don't have a lot of on the site. And by the way, speaking of websites, the new rprof.org is getting there. It's very close. We're incredibly lucky. We have this extraordinary UX designer who is so good, total pro, so thorough. I don't know how we found this person. They reached out to us. I, I didn't even contact them because I was like, dude, we're never gonna hire a pro because we can't afford it. It's just too expensive, it costs an arm and a leg. I mean, for good reason. It's extremely specialized work that you need major experience and training to do well. And they came to us and said, your website's a mess, <laughs> which I knew it was. It's a disaster. I mean, we've really only been, last time we had a pro look at it was when we launched, which was four years ago. And it's so not 
a good fit the way it's structured right now for our content. When we launched, we had like 20 videos. Now we have like over 700. <laughs> I mean, they're not all going to go on the site, but the designer was so smart and they were like, listen, let's do this new strategy. They helped us. Re well, they didn't help us. They redesigned <laughs> the new thumbnails themselves. And so all those changes that you're seeing on the thumbnails, that's not me. That is our phenomenal UX designer. Okay, that's feeling a little better. I felt that I wanted to differentiate this form from this form. And that's pretty important in sculpture. You have to be very deliberate about, okay, which form is going to dominate and which one is going to take a step back. I feel better about the heel, but it's a little bulgy. Let's see. Seven Angelic says I could go either way in terms of style, but go all out. Oh, trust me, I will. <laughs> Fiona says, what do you suggest should be the first items to make a still life out of? <coughs> well, Fiona, I would say if you're a total beginner and you don't have a lot of experience doing it, it does really help to pick objects. Well, I don't know that that's true. Hang on. I think the most important thing, Fiona, pick something you want to paint. If you look at an object and you're like, oh, that's ugly. I don't like that. Don't do it. <laughs> A lot of people are like, oh, well, I should learn how to paint metallic objects or I should learn how to paint a glass of water. That, that's fine. But I think that I feel bad for still life. Still life gets such a bad reputation. Everybody's like, you're so boring. And I'm like, it's only boring if you make it boring. And if it's if you're bored and it's a still life you made, I'm not talking about if you're in a class and the teacher set it up. That's your fault <laughs> if you don't like the subject. What I typically do, Fiona, I really like natural objects. I just love nature. I think nature is so beautiful and the colors and textures, they, they tend to be very diverse. So what I typically do is I just go to the market and sometimes I will buy odd fruits and vegetables that I don't usually eat, but that I think are pretty. And sometimes that's really helpful because otherwise it can be overwhelming because people are like, oh, do I add this, do I add that? And if you just stick to nature objects, that can be helpful. And also, Fiona, we do have a video. You just look up Art Prof Still Life on YouTube, where I actually demonstrate going to the grocery store and picking objects and how to arrange them. I have this cool trick for arranging a still life that I got from a family friend who's a caterer so smart. It's something that you do with the backdrops. The super fun. And it's so cool looking. It's like no effort. And it makes the still life look better. Right away. It still feels a little wonky, but I feel like I'm spending too much time on the side. Although today's sculpture is in a really different place than last week. My pace will be slower. And it is more okay for me to spend longer on one section. God's Little Artist says, I don't like being alone doing art. I understand completely. Sometimes I need the headspace, but most of the time I really need the feedback. I need the support. I need ideas that I can get from other people. And there are so many things that I just would never come up with on my own. Like that stream I did with Deep D, where we transformed Steve Buscemi into a monster. 
I was gonna assume that, oh, well, I, I can't add any more colored pencil right now because the colored pencil is just not gonna work on top of the oil pastel. And then Deepti was like, no, you should try it. And I did, and it, it really helped. And I was like, wow, this worked. And if I had not been there with Deepti, I would not have done it because I would have in my head canceled out that option. I would have said, oh, it's not gonna work. I wouldn't have even tried, but because Deep D was there to give me that little nudge and say, you know, you should try it. That's a big difference. So getting ideas, getting inspiration, that motivational boost is very important. I mean, I need the motivational boost as much as all of you. Here's an example. Does anybody ever feel that based on the reaction or, or maybe even lack of reaction on social media, <clears throat> how easy it is to make the assumption that, oh, well, if I'm not getting a reaction out of this work, it must not be good. And I totally get it. And I myself do that all the time. In fact, I was doing that I do it all the time in terms of YouTube. I guess because YouTube is, I mean, YouTube is where we put our work, but YouTube is a strange place. <laughs> it's it's a weird video game. And I'm like walking around trying to find all the gold coins and the Easter eggs that are buried. And I'm trying to look up the answers on line and not finding them. But anyway, it's easy when you're not getting a reaction just to assume, well, it must be me. If it's not performing well, it must be because my content is not good. And I fall into that a lot. So who here feels that way? Because I was talking to somebody. Oh, wow, that is not thick enough. So I'm to somebody in the voice channel for our Patreon supporters. And they were making these beautiful little drawings. And I thought they were so elegant and unusual and they, they were using really un strange materials that you typically do not see in a drawing. And I was like really blown away by them. And they said to me, well, I posted them on social media and I got no response. So I assumed that because I was getting the response that they weren't good and that I wouldn't make anymore. And I was like, are you kidding? I love these, these are phenomenal. And so it's very frustrating because it's like part of you wants to use social media and the engagement level to discern, okay, is this worth pursuing? On the other hand, it's like sometimes if you listen to that too much, because just because something performs well on social media, it doesn't mean it's a good artwork. <laughs> like there's a lot of really not very interesting artwork on there that gets millions of likes and views and everything. And I have posted stuff on my Instagram that got very little reaction, but okay, here's an example. I did this series of torn tissue paper drawings of portraits. I think it was in 2016. And I did a whole body of them. And I got some stuff on social media, but it wasn't really, people didn't seem that excited about it. And I was like, okay, that's fine, whatever. And then I submitted the same body of work and I won a Massachusetts Cultural Council grant which for me was a big deal because I had never won like a bona fide artist grant, which at my age, <laughs> most people who are on the map have won one much sooner <laughs> than me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, th this is bona fide evidence that social media is not the only way to gauge the value of your work. And so I remember that. I, re I tell myself, you know, Clara, you didn't get a lot of likes, but you did win that Massachusetts Cultural Council grant. So that to me was a very concrete example of just, it doesn't line up social media and other parts of the art world. I want to give a shout out to Jill Kama and also to Anna Weeder, thank you both so much for the super chats. Your contributions are so important. I know that a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just 
a little bit. I'm like, no, it matters. It all matters. And for us, it's a motivational boost as well, because I think what happens with me when I see what people are learning and gaining from our platform and watching their work change and evolve, it just makes me want to work harder for all of you to give you more. But of course, sometimes that's frustrating because I'm like, Clara, you have to sleep. <laughs> like, it's definitely a balance. But every single little boost you give us, every like you put on the video, any comment, any level of engagement helps us with the YouTube gods. And when we have financial resources, we can really give you fireworks. It's very exciting. So thank you so much, everybody. This community is truly the heart of what Art Prof is all about. W315 says, would you ever set up a still life and sculpt it? Oh my gosh, I, I never thought about that. Okay, the wheels are turning. <laughs> we'll see. Ginny says that sculpting tool looks exactly like a beautician's extracting tool. I might try to use it. <gasps> I don't even know what that beautician tool looks like, but that sounds kind of awesome. In fact, when I was in art school, I did a whole bunch of these plaster sculptures that I carved from plaster blocks. And there was this one dental tool one of my friends had a family member who was a dentist. And so she had all these dental tools she was using for sculpture and I loved it. And so that's why I'm just not a fan of people getting very territorial about sculpture tools because my feeling is if you can sculpt with a Sharpie, if this works for you, awesome. Who cares? It does not have to be a sculpture tool. Whatever helps you make the work. MJ says, as a teenager, I find my life is revolving around social media. All my friends got it. So I got it. I must say that social media has destroyed my confidence completely. I'm so sorry to hear that, MJ. And this is one of those circumstances where I just think, I am so glad I didn't grow up with social media as a teen because I cannot imagine the pressure on teens today with social media because it's not just artwork. It's, it's like your whole social life is embedded into social media. And I've seen it with my kids because I have noticed that their friendships, the success or sustainability of their friendship with somebody is very much about which platforms they are on or not on. For example, one of my daughters said to me, I was like, oh, well, have you talked to this friend for a while? And she said to me, oh, well, she's not really on Discord, so we don't talk much. And then sometimes it's like, oh, well, you talk to this person. Oh, yeah, they're on Discord all day. So we talk all day. And so it's like it's so much dependent upon just does this person know how to use Discord and how often are they on it? And depending on that, are you on it? And does it make you want to be on it more? Oh, it's such a wacky world to investigate. Here's another thought. This is actually my favorite sculpture tool. But the issue with this tool, and it's got two sides, is that it's a little bit big. And the sculpture that I'm making right now is kind of small. So if I'm sculpting let's say a three foot tall figure. This is great because you can go in and do all these cool things, but I don't know that this is gonna work on the scale. Let me just try a little bit of it and let's just see if it works on the scale, it may not. But this is hands down my favorite sculpture tool. I mean, I'd have to sculpt a big foot <laughs> for it to really be effective. Maybe at some point <clears throat> we can do that, but for now at least, okay, let me just try a little bit on this side to get to the right reference photo. Okay, so let's see. So you can see this is what it does. It creates these, it's almost like 3D cross hatching. 
So it creates this coarseness to the surface, but the really cool thing, it's very easy to even things out because the, the issue with this ribbon tool, because it doesn't have the thin wire wrapped around it, it tends to cut into the clay just a little bit too dramatically. So if I were to demo this, okay, here, let me show you. Let me just stick a piece of clay here. Okay, so the issue with this ribbon tool is that if I do that action, if I do this, okay, you can end up with these gouges. Okay, so let's say I'm trying to make this a little bit more flat. I can keep trying to do that. But the thing is, because it doesn't have the ribbon wrapped around it, does everybody see you can still see the individual strokes? Now, this is different because it has this wire wrapped around it. If I go in and I try to do this, yes, yeah, see, it makes this very dramatic crosshatch stroke, obviously. But look at how satisfying this is. <laughs> So what I can do is I can stroke in multiple directions like this. And yes, it's very rough, but here's the thing. Ultimately, what you would end up doing is taking your finger and then smudging some of it down, or you can certainly do it with other tools as well. And so this creates a very even texture. But you can see here, because the form is pretty small, the texture is a little bit too dramatic for what I want. And so it may not be worth doing on this scale. But you can see if the foot was like three times the size it is now. Although, I don't know. That's not that bad. <laughs> Let me fix a couple things. I might try to use this tool later. I don't know that it's actually going to help me, but that that's the concept. And this is, abs oh my God, I could use this tool for 6,000 hours and never get tired. It's so awesome. Katia says, I would give you money if I had it. Well, thank you, Katia. We appreciate the sentiment. And you know something? You don't need money to help us out. For example... If you like a video, if you leave a comment, any form of engagement that you can give us on YouTube, that is a boost with the YouTube gods. So you don't have to contribute financially to help us out. It's incredibly helpful when people come in and they leave comments and do all those things for us because, guys, <laughs> YouTube hates me. I don't know what I did. <laughs> YouTube doesn't like me. It's frustrating because YouTube, it's so unpredictable. And that's why if you watch videos on how to use YouTube, which I do quite a bit, what you'll hear a lot is people say, oh, don't rely on the ad revenue. And it's true. The ad revenue on YouTube is so unpredictable. It changes so much. Month to month, we never know if the ad revenue is going to go up or if it's going to go down. And lately, it's, it's been going down. <laughs> it's not going great right now. So we could use a boost. So like a video, leave a comment, anything like that helps us out. Because there are many ways you can help the community. You don't always have to contribute financially. Let me just try this tool. I'm just going to see. And if it really drives me crazy, I'm going to stop it. But I do love this sculpture tool. And they make bigger ones, too. Like there's one that's like double the width of this tool that's like awesome if you're working on like a big sculpture. Okay. This is sort of a nice little valley. I mean, I like this sculpture tool so much that I, <laughs> I don't know, maybe the scale thing doesn't matter. We'll see. I really need to work on the big toe. The big toe is a mess. Like it doesn't have, I don't know. It looks a little bit too soft to me. I want to make it a little bit more bony looking. I mean, it depends on the person's foot. This is a fairly bony big toe, so I don't want to ignore that. And by the way, 
some of you who hang out in the Discord, and if you're not in Discord, don't you want to be cool? Don't you want to sit at the cool kids' lunch table? I was never cool. This is my one chance to sit at the cool kids' lunch table. Join us in the Discord because it's awesome in there. And very excited about this. Typically, after a live stream, we will go into the Discord and we'll hang out in the Art Alongs channel for the Art Alongs. For the Talking Head streams, we go into post live streams. And the post stream chat is so fun because oftentimes, especially now that there are more people watching, there are so many questions like I didn't get a chance to look at them or maybe there's an image or a link that I want to share with people, but I can't do it during the stream. The post live stream chat is so good for that. And so we've been doing that for a while. That's not new. What we are doing that's new today. We're going to also, as always, go into the Art Alongs channel, but we are also going to go into the Art Alongs stage channel, which is very exciting. Stage channel, if you don't know what it is, it's a voice channel, but it's a voice channel that's designed for larger groups because we have a voice channel and it's for Patreon supporters, but voice channels are limited in numbers. I think you can only have like 25 people in any given voice channel. And so if you only have 25 people, that's fine. But the thing is, a lot of times we have way more than 25 people who want to chat after an art long. And so in Discord stage, basically we have our staff quote on stage. So we're on audio, everybody's on audio. There's no video involved, okay? Which is also nice because then I don't have to look so great. <laughs> not like I, I don't know. This is not something I worry about. But uh, I will be on quote the stage and you can all go into that channel and you can listen or you can raise your hand to speak. And so this is a great opportunity because I can now speak to more of you on voice. So if you can't afford the Patreon option, this still gives you a chance to ask me a question on voice. And I know some people are very nervous about that. Some people don't want to do that. That's fine. Just listen. But the people who want to ask a question that's on voice, it's great. I love hearing the voices. The voices are wonderful. It's really fun. So we're going to try that today for the first time. And then starting in June, once a week, we'll have a stage session after an hour long. And it will be whoever's in that hour long. So if Kat and I do an hour long and there's a stage session after that, she and I will be on the stage and you can ask us questions. We will critique artwork, but it has to be art along artwork. We won't be critiquing your personal work. If you want to critique, if you want us to critique your personal work on voice, you can sign up on Patreon to get access. And that's a minimum $20 a month. You can also do another tier that's a little bit higher, which gives you access two times a month. But we wanted to have a free version too. So that way people who can't afford the Patreon still get some access to our stuff. Because in June, we are gonna be cutting back on our streams so we can have more time for editing. And also so that when we do do the art alongs, they're a bigger deal, that they're longer, they have the voice. And so I'm just hoping by consolidating that, it makes a better, more interactive experience because the voice thing is so powerful. It's amazing. See, Cantrell says, is it true we need to watch only 30 minutes? 30 minutes of an ad for you to get paid? I, I don't have any idea how it works. I mean, if you wanna help us with the YouTube algorithm, the best thing you can do is keep a video playing until the end. YouTube loves that. So if you watch a video and you get bored, just leave it running <laughs> like on another tab. YouTube loves that. that. That's actually super helpful because the issue is that YouTube ranks how 
much of the video people watch. So if somebody watches the video and they click away after 30 seconds, that's bad. <laughs> if somebody watches the video and they watch the whole thing beginning to end, that's awesome. YouTube loves that. So a lot of it's about retention and watching through to the end. You know, it's up to you guys. That, I'm just saying, if you want to help us out, that's a little thing you can do that actually I think does have a pretty significant impact. It's hard to gauge. Sometimes you're like, is this really worth it? But I think that one really is. Leaving a comment is, liking the video, all that stuff is pretty helpful. Okay. I'm trying to sort out the toes because I made these like mountainous phalanges, which are not good. And like, whoa, it looks terrible. So I'm just going to cut all of those down. I think the, the feet, the toes are like more flat. I think I made them like really bulgy last time. I don't know. I, I'm just going to fix a couple of forms on this view and then I'll come around to the other side and see exactly what's going on. But it is nice to go in and clean up some of the wonky passages here. Like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I look at the old stuff. I'm like, what? Why would you do that, Clara? Why? I think I will use this tool. This is handy. In some places. I mean, it's not handy on the toes, but on these bigger spots up here where I'm trying to just make a vein pop. The other thing about this tool, you can't see this, but the way it feels in the clay, it feels more even. I feel that when I'm using this tool, it's a little bumpier. And so I do feel that this tool is easier to control. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's use a little bit of it. I guess I was just worried that the texture it makes would be super distracting on a small scale, but it's not that bad, actually. So just give it a shot. It's hard to gauge in the reference photo how much to trust the shadows. Some of the shadows are really dramatic. And then I'm like, okay, is that the form or is it just the lighting happens to be very dramatic there? It's hard to tell. Yeah, here too, a lot of tension in this spot. So I'm going to try to tighten this up by really digging into there. It's also good for rounding off forms. Like sometimes the forms are just all like bumpy. And so this, this just really, really helps me to even out some of those bumpy spots. Yeah, I'm glad I'm using this tool. They, they do have another size of this tool that's a lot smaller, but it's so small that it almost doesn't do very much. So I found that the medium size, which is this size, is necessary. The one that's smaller is it's too small. And then the bigger one is awesome, but only on like a very big scale. It's also helpful for surface. Sometimes I like showing just a little bit of the hatching. I don't know. It's been a while since I've used this tool. I used it a lot when I was in graduate school, but it's been a while. It's very satisfying though, I will say that. Vitamin says, do you get sponsors? I think I remember one stream about printmaking and it was sponsored. We do have some, <clears throat> there's different tiers though. And it all depends on what type of relationship the sponsors want. For example, there are some companies who don't want to buy ads, but they'll give us art supplies. There's that. And depending on the company and their interest in resources, they may want an ad, but maybe they don't want to pay that much. So yeah, it's, and it's a ton of work. I mean, <laughs> the best way I can describe sponsors, honestly, I feel like I'm like mass dating. It's terrible. 
it's like every single sponsor is a different person, a different company with different needs, different rules or maybe no rules on how they work with influencers because it's weird. There are some places that are huge companies. And so obviously they have like a whole division that's just for YouTube influencers. And actually those companies are super easy to work with because they already have a system in place. But then sometimes if it's like a smaller company and I'll approach them because I'm like, oh, this is a really good fit for our content, but they are not that big. They don't have a lot of experience and I have to really hold their hand through the process. That can end up actually being a ton of work because there's a lot of negotiation and it depends on the marketing person. And it's a lot of work. And then, oh man, the ghosting. I cannot even like, can somebody please tell me, does the ghosting ever stop? Like, do you ever get big enough in the world that people won't ghost you because it's embarrassing? Because <laughs> like, I had this one company that I've been trying to get in touch with for a while and I miraculously booked this call with them and they were acting like all enthusiastic and I was like that's it this is finally it and like two follow-up emails later nothing I was like really can't you just tell me up front <laughs> you're not interested like just don't waste my time like I don't understand like I I'm at the point now where I've been ghosted and rejected so many times by so many companies that I feel, I know this sounds crazy. I feel that an early rejection is like merciful. It's like, thank you for rejecting me early on. So I don't have to be led on and on and on, which is a, what a lot of companies end up doing is that they just lead you on and you get your hopes up and then you get screwed later. It sucks. Ugh, maybe, maybe if I'm Ira Glass people won't ghost me anymore. I, I would like to get that get to that level of prestige in the world where I'm famous enough that people are too embarrassed to ghost me. <laughs> Maybe there there is a point where that happens, but I'm certainly not there yet. It's a ton of work. That that's all I can say is I don't know. A lot of things sound very easy to do. <laughs> like just do this i'm like okay but then it's like you actually go and do it it's a crazy amount of work to do it well i mean you can do a crappy job on anything that's not a problem but i'm not into that <laughs> as you can tell so in some ways you could say maybe it's my fault that things are the way they are because i have high expectations but i don't think i should dilute the quality of our content just to make things easier for myself doesn't work that way Sketch boss says it sounds like a relationship. It, it totally is. And it's like, I get totally mixed messages. <laughs> like I had this one company, the marketing person, they're nice and they have helped us, but <laughs> gosh, they're so hot and cold. And I, I don't know how to deal because they will do this thing where I'll send them an email. I won't hear anything for weeks. And then other times I'll send them an email and I get a reply like the next day, yes, we'll do this. And then they do it. And I'm like, okay. And then there was another period where I had sent them something. I said, I have this idea, blah, blah, blah. And they called me. I, I mean, they emailed me and said, oh, I want to set up a call. I was like, oh, okay, sure. That's strange, but whatever, <laughs> based on your prior history. And then we have this like hour long phone call and it's like very chummy and they're like saying, oh, we love what you do and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is sort of weird because based on their inconsistent past, I was like, okay, what do I believe here? And then we had that great call and then I emailed them again saying, can we do this? Nothing. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe this is better than dating. I think dating must be even more painful, but this is just like, oh my God, people. Just tell me I suck, please. Like, you're just like begging for somebody to tell you that you suck. It's actually better. So like when people talk about, oh, rejection so hard, I'm like, please reject me. Please, please put me out of my pain. Do it early. <laughs> Thank you.
Seven Angelic says it's not very professional. If they're going to take your call, they should give you a yes or no. Yeah, see, here's the thing. It's like if you have no relationship with a company and it's a total cold call, like, fine. I, I totally get why somebody would just ignore your email. That's fine. I get it. I mean, I do that too sometimes when people are just like asking me for stuff. And I'm like, I have no relationship with you. Goodbye. I feel like it's okay for me to not do that. And yet, whoa, I just like made up a vein there. Let's just take it out. <laughs> like that. That's what I like about sculpture. It's so easy to just remove things. You can just do it. And so the other weird thing is I've had companies where I did something for them. So we had a relationship and we'd had calls and then I asked for help with something else. And then they would just ghost that email. I'm like, just write the email and say, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you. Like, is it that embarrassing? Is it that awkward for them to say, nope? I mean, like, I don't know, maybe because I'm a teacher, I have no problem saying to people, nope, can't do it. <laughs> like, let's just, let's get that point across. I can't. I think that that's what people should do. Just be upfront about this stuff. It's so frustrating. <laughs> So yeah, what ends up happening because of all the dating <laughs> with the companies, you end up wasting a lot of time. So you, you end up trying to follow these leads that ultimately go nowhere. And so a lot of your time just does not end up feeling that productive. I mean, that that's the way of the world. I'm not saying that I should get a shortcut or anything like that. It's just frustrating because it's a lot of time spent trying to figure out what's worth pursuing, what's not. And then sometimes people are weird too. Like I had this other company that acted so not interested <laughs> when I asked them about advertising, I'm like, nope, we don't care. I was like, okay, goodbye. Like I totally crossed them off the list. Sometimes I don't do that. Sometimes I'll just like bother them again if they act sort of interested. But th these people were so clearly not interested. And then... <laughs> Three weeks later, out of the blue, can we run an ad tomorrow? I'm like, dude, what? They're like, our registration starts. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you if it worked out or not because, oh my God, it was such a mess. <laughs> I sort of want to put the veins in, but I'm thinking that maybe I'm jumping the gun. Tell me in the chat, should I just do the veins? Should I just give in? given to all my terrible tendencies and do the things. Or is it too soon? Tell me, give me my own advice. I'm always telling people, too soon for details. Tell me if it's too soon. Because oh, trust me, there's a lot of other things that need to get worked on here, but the veins are they're pretty significant from this point of view. This is not a small form. It's so weird. Like the, the toes look so flat from the other side, but from this side, they actually look more 3D. And I wonder, it's because of the roundness of the end of the toe? I'm not sure. It's really hard to say. Hmm. I do want to make stuff like this more dramatic though. So as everybody see, this is like, this is called an undercut in sculpture. And so you want the undercuts to be more dramatic. And it's tricky because the reference photos I have, because it's a living person <laughs> that posed for these, the toes are a little bit different from photo to photo. They're not exactly the same, which is fine. I, I think we have to learn to live with that. If you're going to work from life, you have to accept the lack of consistency and unpredictability and embrace it. Let that be a good thing. Don't be frustrated. That is something you have to deal with. Make, make it part of your process. This is great for undercuts. See how I'm going under and then I'm going up? It's really great for articulating form that way. I do tend to like this side better. This side has a little bit of a roundness to it. This side is very geometric, so I don't tend to use it as much for the human figure, but it's it's good for anything that you're doing. It's just, it's all a matter of personal preference. 
it's like brushes. Nobody can pick your tools for you. You have to just find the ones that you think really work for you. Okay, let's just get these undercuts. A little bit more dramatic. That's where this tool is great because it's so sharp and it really like digs in between like that. Although I am spending too long on this side. I really should have moved on. We'll see. This toe is weird too. Like the way the toenail is done is sort of strange. Okay, maybe I'll clean up some of the form here. I guess what I need here, I need like the, you see this like roundness? There's like this almost arch because of the toenail. Like this really is the plane of the toenail, what I'm doing right now. Like that. Squinting. I like this tool at this scale. It's actually working okay. I didn't think it was gonna work, but I think it does. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go through every view and I'm just gonna clean up the form with this tool because I see a lot of like bumpy spots that just need to be evened out. But I'm happy I stuck with it. I, I really was making the assumption that it was gonna work, but it did. I guess I should just stop making assumptions. <laughs> That seems to be sound like that's not going to work. And then it totally does. So don't listen to yourself if you're me. <laughs> so Katia is asking, what's an undercut? So an undercut is anytime the form goes like under, like this is an undercut. Okay. Like this is an undercut or something that's like in between these two forms. The reason why undercuts matter is because if eventually you decide, let's say I finish the sculpture and I want to cast it, make a plaster waste mold or a silicone mold or something like that, the undercuts are a pain <laughs> in the mold making process. Because if you pour like silicone, into this, the silicone goes into the undercut. It goes like in here. And so oftentimes what happens is sometimes the undercuts in the mold, they get like stuck. Like if the undercuts are too deep, they'll actually like tear away. It's a mold making issue. Like if you're just sculpting like this, it doesn't matter. But we refer to them as undercuts because in the mold making process, oftentimes there are these like weird undercuts and there's certain technical things you can do to anticipate any problems you might have. But yeah, undercuts can really, oh my gosh, they're a pain. But they look good. That, that's the thing, is that you need undercuts to show the drama on the form. Like right now, does everybody see I'm cleaning up, just like tracing around the toes? Like it just makes the form a lot more believable. So like here, I'm cleaning up that edge. So if I go around and show you this side, like this side, this is sort of a mess. You can see it's not very well articulated. You compare it to here, this looks a lot cleaner and a lot easier to look at. Carrie Ann says, if you take the time to do the tendons, wouldn't you want to add some veins? Oh yeah, for sure. I guess the question for me is more, when do I add the veins? Because the whole thing, if you look at this view, okay? So we see these are the tendons and the veins in the photo, they're like over the tendons. So the veins to me are cosmetic. Like they don't have anything to do with what the bones and muscles are doing. It's, it's almost like, think about veins. <laughs> like somebody took a worm and like stuck it on your foot. That's sort of what a vein is, except it's like infused into your foot. That's gross. <laughs> I just think about worms because we have an axolotl, Gmo, and he eats worms. So I'm always handling worms <laughs> to feed to him. He's actually hard to feed. Sometimes I'll feed him a worm. He'll just spit it out. Oh, 
it's so hard or like sometimes we have to cut it in half because the worm is like too big for him so yeah that that's more the question is like is putting in the veins right now going to be a distraction is going to make it harder for me to really see the forms i don't know i'm going to do another pass to the other side because i've sort of been ignoring this and then i'll take another look Jess is asking, is this modeling clay? If so, because I got a lot of it and I want to give it a try. Yeah, it's modeling clay. The most important thing is that it's oil-based. If it's oil-based, you don't have to worry about wrapping it up and keeping it wet, which is so helpful. There's no dust. For a home studio, it's really great. <laughs> Seven Angelic says, go for the veins. If it's not working, you can lop them off and try later. <laughs> I love that. That's the advantage of sculpture. You're like, you don't like this toe? Cut it off. <laughs> Although Sketchpaw says, no, I feel like the veins would take away from the structure. And Jill says, if a vein or two helps you visualize the rest, then yes. All good arguments. You guys are making this hard for me. <laughs> Carrie Ann says, client relations are the face of a company. Sad that some don't care. It's just not a priority or maybe the marketing person supervisor doesn't care and it's not, I don't know. There's a million reasons why things work out that way. W305 says, not that black and white, Clara. Sometimes companies like your vibe, but don't have the right fit at the moment, but they want to keep up a relationship. That's a good point. And I think that I have definitely seen that with press because I've had journalists who I have talked to and had some interest, but then it dropped off and then they would come back. And for press people, I have a little bit more sympathy because for them, it's so much about the news cycle. Like if there's some big breaking story, they have to like drop one story, which is lower priority, which is of course me. And that I get, it's just, I think that there's a nicer way to do it. Like, I, I think you can, do that without all the ghosting and the mind games. <laughs> Fiona says, any type of media in which you get inspiration from books and movies. Oh, I get it from everywhere. I get inspiration when I go for a walk. Yesterday, I went for a walk with my daughter and we live near this really cute little nature trail. And there were all these dandelions that were huge the week before. They were like monster dandelion plants. And I'd never seen this do this before because I lived in Massachusetts my whole life. But the dandelions here, they get so big that the flower part of the dandelion gets all like curly. I'm like, what? Like I'd never seen them like that before. They almost look like Art Nouveau designs. Like they were so, I was like, I had no idea. A dandelion could be so elegant. It's really cool. Although I did go on a mega book buying spree. I just should not have the Amazon app on my phone. I should just keep it off my phone. It's a bad idea. They just make it way too easy. I mean, I think it's frightening that all it takes is a tap and a swipe. That's it. I mean, Amazon, oh, they, they have figured us out. That's alarming to me. That is a tap and swipe to buy. But I do it. I totally do it. And I'm sorry, Amazon Prime works. It's, that free shipping is really hard to resist. So anyway, I went on this book buying spree and I bought Animals in Motion by Edward Mewbridge. Let me type the name in the chat because the name is so weird, the spelling. Uh, I don't, in fact, I don't even know if I'm going to do it right. Edward So the book that I bought was called Animals in Motion. And some of you probably have seen, I did do two figure drawing streams that use the human figure in motion by Mewbridge, same thing. And I'd always known about the animal book, but I never bought it. And I was like so psyched when I bought it because you can find 
images of it online, but whoa, there's so many pictures in that book. And weird animals too. I mean, half the book is horses. That's fine because you know, you could transform a horse in anything, but there was a sloth in there. There were baboons, a whole section on pigs, camels. I was like, this is extraordinary because people always think you need super high resolution, crazy detail photos. But I was like, you know something, if I wanted to do a drawing of a horse jumping in midair, where are you going to find that? You're going to find it in Newbridge's book. He's got all those. And yeah, the pictures are not super high resolution, but they're enough because you could get the rest of the limbs or details of the horse somewhere else. But he gives you the action. He gives you the gesture and the movement. And that is the thing that would not be easy for you to do on your own. So I bought that. And I'm sure we're going to do stream on that at some point. But I just love seeing those images and going, Newbridge, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> what got you to think? Because it's a brilliant solution. But it's like, there's nothing else like that book. I can't think of anything right now. I mean, it made me think that somebody should make like a contemporary version of it with like high res photography because the technology is so much better now than it was during Mewbridge's time period. I was like, if I had time, <laughs> I totally would because it's such an incredible resource. So I look at that and I guess I watch movies. Oh, you guys. I watched the saddest movie last night. <laughs> this made me want to cry. It's so tragic. Okay, so please explain. If you're a movie casting director, okay, and you're like, I have this movie. Okay, the movie I watched was The Mauritanian. It's got Jodie Foster in it. Oh, I love her. She's such a queen. She's amazing. It's got Jodie Foster and Benedict Cumberbatch. And so I'm like, okay, I have to watch this because he's in it, right? He doesn't look that good. I don't know. They make him look kind of dorky <laughs> in the movie. Like, they're definitely not trying to make him look hot or anything like that. But it's fine. Whatever. We got the voice. <laughs> you know, he's got this, like, hot British accent. But in the movie, he's supposed to be this American. And I'm like, why would you hire somebody with this hot British accent and have them do an American accent? Like, that just makes me want to cry. And so it just made me sad. I'm like, what a waste. What a waste of a hot British accent. <laughs> Although it's not as painful, I will say, as when you have an American actor or actress who's trying to fake a British accent. It sounds terrible most of the time. I feel like I know like one actor who can do that. Like, who was it? Was it Renee Zellweger? I think she was in that Bridget Jones's Diary film. And it just was painful to listen to her try to do a British accent. It was really awful. <laughs> so I just wanted to cry. I'm like, I know there's a British accent underneath all of those words, Benedict, but I can't hear it. <laughs> that That's a tragedy. That is truly, truly terrible. <laughs> that's okay. He wasn't in the movie that much. He's sort of a supporting character. I mean, that, that movie was more about Jodie Foster and the prisoner who was in it. Picking a little, should try to move on. It's hard, there's so many veins here and I'm trying to make sense of what's going on. Like I'm trying to, I guess because there's this like roundness here and maybe I need to build more. Or maybe I need to articulate this muscle here, this tendon, which should be pretty taut. Yeah, I'm going to leave that alone for now. I think I'm picking. I think if I come up here and do something a little more dramatic. Maybe that'll be better. Yeah, I'm glad I, I'm glad I did this tool. This, this was good. I think 
what I'm discovering is I should not listen to my own assumptions because apparently I'm always wrong. And I do think some of the form is a little bit too dramatic, but let's just leave it because I'm just worried that I'm gonna make the form too flat. And I would rather err on it being too dramatic than being too understated in sculpture. I mean, I guess that's the case too with drawing. Oh, and the heel needs to be more flat here. Let's try that. Maybe more geometric? I'm just gonna fix that undercut. That's better. Vitamin says, how do you create a timetable so you can fit in creativity and art? I've recently finished art school extracurriculum type. I feel so empty because there's no set time or objective to complete. It's so hard. I mean, when I was an art school student, I used to remember resenting all of the deadlines and all the projects and all oh, these professors are breathing down my neck. And it's so strange that after you leave school, if you go to school, you miss the deadlines. <laughs> the people breathing down your neck, it's actually something you start to crave. It's bizarre. One thing that's helpful for me is I try to have at least something I'm going to apply for on the horizon. Maybe it's an artist grant. For example, we do have on artprof.org listings of all kinds of artist grants, international and in the US. And so I'll say to myself, okay, I want to apply for this grant. The deadline is at the end of June. So I can say, okay, because I'm applying for this grant and this grant is asking me for 10 images and I have three that I really like, I have to make sure that I make seven artworks by the time that the deadline for this grant rolls along. And that helps me just having something really concrete because it's like these random deadlines that people try to make for themselves, like I'm gonna make 15 paintings. But then you're like, why? Why do you, it's like, I think for a lot of us, we need to have a very compelling concrete reason, like why those 15 paintings need to be made. And so if it's something like a grant or I, I wanna, send out postcards because I'm trying to start an illustration career. And maybe the deadline for the postcards is beginning of August and that's it. And then you can time out, okay, well, if the deadline's at the end of July and I'm trying to do five pieces, that means that every two weeks I have to finish a piece. I'm sorry to be so boring about it, but that that's sometimes <laughs> the only practical way to get things done is to schedule it. I can't do anything without scheduling it. You guys should see my phone. My phone alarm is like, text this person at 1039. <laughs> it's terrible. But I get stuff done. I mean, that that's the thing. It's living by that alarm is very helpful. It's hard because I think people think about creativity as this very <clears throat> loose, spontaneous thing. And it can be those things. But <laughs> sometimes you just got to schedule it. Sometimes that's what you need to make that happen. Need more tension back here. I think on the Achilles tendon, I'm trying to like really make that part pop. So what I'm gonna do is soften the transition up here and then make this transition down here a little bit more harsh maybe show this plane of the heel more dramatically. So you might think that at this stage, oh, you're just smoothing it out. I'm not. I'm saying that's a plane, that's a plane, and that's a plane. I'm trying to distinguish those three planes all at once. Vitamin says, I guess I just need to hear that it's possible to do it by myself. It really can feel like it's not possible because until you've done it yourself, 
and it has worked and gotten you results, you just feel like, is this going to work? And a lot of being a creative person is like that. Like taking these risks, like doing these things, you're like, is this going to work? Is this going to be worth my time? Because it feels bad to work on something knowing this could just be a big waste of time. <laughs> like it feels crappy. Like does anybody here, do you ever feel like you just don't want to do something because you're like, you know what? There's no guarantee it's going to work and it might just be a waste of time. I think a lot of people feel that way. Like I, I was editing this short. I released it yesterday. It's called Your Sketchbooks Should Look Like Crap, which they should. <laughs> I, I'm just tired of these perfect sketchbook videos and I'm just trying to dispel the myth because it is so much a myth, you guys. Okay, so I've been playing around with editing on my phone, which I don't typically do. I'm a Adobe Premiere girl and I do full out complicated video tutorials that take forever. I think about them as our prof movie premieres. <laughs> they come out once every few months. <laughs> I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch isn't there, but that's okay. <laughs> so we have that, but because of the short for con content now, I have been starting to think of myself, you know, Claire, maybe you shouldn't do everything on Premiere. Maybe Premiere is overkill for what you're trying to do. Maybe if you would just edit on your phone, things would be faster and you could get the same results. But then there's the part of you that says, oh, but then I have to learn this new app. And do I have to pay for this new app? And I already know how to do it. <laughs> so many annoying thoughts go through your head. And so yesterday I was like, okay, I really want to do this short because I have this idea. And I thought to myself, okay, I know I should learn a phone editing app, but I don't have the headspace today. I just want to make the short. And I'm just going to make it in Premiere because Premiere is what I know. And yes, I think it's overkill, but let's just do it anyway. Because for me right now with the resources I have, that is the most efficient. That makes the most sense. So I just did it. And I'm uploading all the stills. I took all original photos for the video. And I'm in Premiere. <laughs> I'm like tweaking it like it's an art prof movie video, right? And I'm like a little here, a little there. And I go into Photoshop and I'm cleaning up little spots. I, stuff that you're just like, who, who cares? I'm the only person that cares about this stuff, right? <laughs> and then you're annoyed at yourself because you're like, why? Why am I, why am I doing all this extra work when probably nobody cares? <laughs> and it's not going to matter anyway. <laughs> and so I'm doing all this stuff. And I release it. And then afterwards... I'm like, Clara, that was so dumb. Why did you spend all that time on that video? That was so not necessary. <laughs> you need to be a more efficient artist. <laughs> you can't produce videos like this all the time. It's not sustainable. So that's my thought right after I release it. But then I release it. I don't know that it's blowing up, but it's definitely performing better on TikTok than any of our other TikTok videos, and I think you all know that I'm trying to figure out TikTok. And I was like, oh my God, tangible results. It, it worked to a degree. I'm, I'm not saying I conquered the world, but I was like, wow, okay. So maybe it was worth that time. Maybe it was worth me agonizing over the little white dots in the background that I took out with the clone tool in Photoshop. So vitamin, I get it. That uh, until you have visible proof that, oh, this is not a waste of time and this will work, it's great. But it, it takes a leap of faith, that's for sure. All right, I need to work on this heel a little bit more. I, at the very least, I just want to cover the whole foot with this tool because I just find it distracting when one part of the foot has the texture and the other part does not. I think that's hard to look at. Sam K says, I make at least one artwork every day to feel, quote, productive. 
Used to spend all my time on one painting, tried to finish by specific deadline, but it's hard. Painting is such a soul-sucking endeavor. So accurate, Sam K. <laughs> I love your choice of words. And yeah, I think that sometimes distributing yourself amongst several artworks, as opposed to say, okay, do this painting, finish it. Okay, start another one. Do this painting, start another one. I think it's easier for me. If I have three artworks in progress at the same time, the advantage for me is ultimately I'm going to get annoyed or frustrated with one of those pieces. And then what you can do is say, okay, well, I'm going to step away from that one for a little bit and I'm going to work on this one. And then when I come back to that one, I'll have had enough time and distance away from it that then I can maybe look at it with a fresh pair of eyes. And so I usually recommend that to people say, listen, have more than one thing going at the same time so that you have that option to step away because the, the starting is the hard part. That's not easy. And in fact, I didn't have a studio for very long. It was just so expensive. I couldn't justify the expense. But when I did, one thing that I did all the time, I never left the studio with stuff finished. I always left when something was in the middle because that way when I came back to the studio, I didn't have to start from scratch. I could just pick up from where I left off and it just made it so much easier to figure out exactly what I was trying to do. So I think it's not just a scheduling issue. It's also spreading yourself out in a way that's reasonable. I mean, you, you don't want to do it where it's like overwhelming you, but I did notice yesterday there were a whole bunch of pieces that I was going to work on. And it was nice to have the luxury to say, I don't want to work on that one today. I, I want to do this one today and not feel that I was like getting behind in any way. <sighs> I need to fix this. This big toe is really annoying me. I feel like it's, I don't know if it's too wide. It's such a strange form. Like the other toes are so much more straightforward. Maybe I just need to deal with that stupid toenail. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to just draw the toenail. I'm not usually a fan of like drawing things in on sculpture, but I think in this case, I, I just really need to place it because it's, it's getting in the way of the other stuff. And I do want to do like another pass of this tool over all the toes because I think the toes did not quite get everything that they needed on the first pass. And those tendons sure could use a little bit of work too. Seven Angelic says, someone once said, don't give your project 100%, go 90% because it will be good enough and you'll get it done. But that's hard to do. Oh, it's so hard to do. <laughs> I had a former student who said to me that his biggest issue was he was such a perfectionist that he would forget that he didn't have to do A plus work all the time, that B plus was fine. It was totally good enough for any professional situation. But <laughs> it's hard to do if you want to do the A plus work and you're writing yourself back because, oh, it feels good to do A plus work when you can, when you have the time to do A plus work and you pull it off, it feels amazing. But a lot of the times there is not time to do A plus work. There's too many other things that need to happen. So I consider it a luxury. Like if I can do the A plus work, in a reasonable amount of time and I pull it off, I'm like score. But that's not all the time. That's once in a while. I think that that will be the case. I'd like to know from people in the chat, we have this texture now because of the tool that I'm using. Do people think I should keep 
a little bit of that texture or do you want it smooth? <laughs> like baby bum smooth. Let me know. I'm curious. It's, it's totally an aesthetic thing. It doesn't have anything to do with what's better. It's just, what's your preference? Or, or maybe what just do you want me to, what do you want to see me do? I mean, it's not even that that's your preference, but what do you want to see? Do you want to see me retain some of that or should we just get rid of it entirely? Ultimately, these are all just style choices. They don't have a lot to do with what makes a better sculpture. It's just a matter of choice. I need to do a little more work on the Achilles tendon. I think that needs... Kazba says, I told my students, just get the work done. There's always time to improve and revise, but if you don't have something to get you going, then you'll never make any work at all. That is so accurate. There's so many people, I think, it, it's such a mental hurdle that people really do feel sort of paralyzed by certain projects. And I say to people, like, listen, you can't live that way. You're going to go crazy because just nothing's going to get started. And I would much rather have a crappy project than no project. I mean, <laughs> neither feels good, but between the two, that, that is the lesser of two evils is to just have something, have something concrete and going back and revising things is so much easier than trying to make it amazing the first time through. In fact, that's why I'm a big fan of just dumping stuff like the most flawed, crappy version. That's how I write. Like when I write something, I never try to write it well the first time. I just do a dump of words and I don't care how stupid I sound. And then I go back and I fix it. And that's so much more manageable to me. Like if I try to sit down and write something and make it sound, it, it doesn't, <laughs> it, it never works. I'm going to take another look at these veins. Okay. Because I think I just want to play with some of the tension. Because there's a couple of these that are tenser than others. Like this one's very tense. This one's crazy. Oh. All right. Let's really make that one pop. Okay, and then up here, this is also very tense. So again, there's parts that are tense and parts that are soft, and I'm just pulling out the ones that I think could be a little more dramatic. Okay, this one should be a little more flat. So this one I'm going to de-emphasize, actually. Make that one more flat, more fluid. And then up here, it does get a little more flat, too. Okay. This is fun. I mean, this is where you can start really putting in those, like, little transitions that are much harder to do early on. I also want to bulk up this form. I mean, I know I've been working on this piece the last stream in the strip, but it's like just starting to get fun. <laughs> like now you're starting to really like look at for the nuances. It's really awesome. Love it. Yeah, so this form I think is less dramatic. I think I made it too much, so pull that down a little bit. This one, too, I think I'm going to soften towards the bottom. Let's try that. JDK says, thanks, Professor Lou, for sharing your behind the scene experiences and frustrations. This is really helping de-romanticizing artists as a career choice. <laughs> Ours is kind of boring sometimes. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you guys that. 
it's not all fun and games, but I think every field is like that. I think people romanticize all kinds of professions. I mean, like I watched that film with Benedict, The Mauritanian, which is all about lawyers and they make it so dramatic. And I'm like, I'm sure it's so boring a lot of the time. And I think like any profession, there, there probably are those moments that are really amazing, but they're, they're few and far in between. There's just so much just grunt work that has to happen before you have those moments. I mean, it just must make lawyers laugh when they see all these legal dramas that just really doesn't even come close probably to the grunt work that has to happen. I mean, God, all those papers. I have a friend who's a lawyer and I just cannot believe all the work that goes into stuff like the writing and the, oh my God, so much. Chase Louie says, great advice. I'm notorious for being hard on myself. That tends to lead me to not finishing projects or I get hung up on something silly. Story of my life, <laughs> Chase Louie. <laughs> I'm so serious. That story I told you all about editing that sketchbook video that I released yesterday, the 32nd one. I was doubting myself the whole way. Clara, who are you to think that you can figure out TikTok? Is TikTok even worth it? This is such a time sink. You have 10,000 other things that are more important right now. You have these three tutorials, they've been sitting in the can and why can't you get to those? And oh my God, it's just like one thing after another. And so that's actually why, I mean, this really depends on the person, but that's why I tell people that I have to be mildly distracted when I'm working. That's why I listen to a podcast or I listen to people helping me with the YouTube gods, because if I think too much, when I'm working, it does not go to a good place. It's, it's ugly. And so I need to be here and working and focused, but not so much that I ruminate over all the dumb things I'm doing because, oh, that goes to a bad place. A little more tension up here. I think I just need to accentuate the Achilles tendon up here, just make it feel tighter. I think my lateral malleolus, is that too bony? I mean, the changes I'm making right now, they're pretty cosmetic. Not a lot is going on in terms of dramatic shifts, but that's the way it should be. It should be a natural progression. I think what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna smooth out a couple sections, not everything. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of everything being smooth, but it is nice to pull out a couple spots. So you can see what I'm doing now is I'm just like pressing and pulling out certain sections. So I'm being selective. I'm not just smoothing everywhere. Like, especially if something is more tense, like this vein here, is a pretty tense moment. I'm going to smooth that out. And it's probably the sections of the form that are a little bit more loose that I'll let the texture stay. But in some of the smaller areas, I'll, I'll really try to just get rid of it entirely. Because I think my preference is mostly smooth for this technique, but with a little bit of texture just to give it a little bit of breathing space. Sometimes when things are too smooth, they feel too perfect. I mean, especially when it's a human figure, you know, it's not like I'm sculpting a vase. <laughs> if you're sculpting a vase, that's quite a different story, I think, than sculpting part of the human figure, which should have a fairly organic feel to it, depending on what you're trying to do but I do find this very satisfying, just going in and touching up 
the surface. Super fun. Katya has got some TikTok advice. Good, because I need all the help I can get. <laughs> Make sure your video catches people's attention in the first few seconds. The attention span of most people is so short, they'll just scroll if they think it's slightly boring. Yeah, this I learned very fast. Because <laughs> the first short that I made, I showed it to my daughter who's 13. And I thought I was doing quick cuts. She's like, this is too long. I was like, what? <laughs> but then I observed myself watching TikTok videos, because I try to watch a few every day just to get some ideas. And I noticed, I thought I had seven seconds. That's the statistic on YouTube, that people take seven seconds to decide whether they want to continue watching. It's not seven seconds, guys. It's like three. And I think on TikTok, it's one, which is insane that it has to be that fast. And so... I have really changed my editing style for that reason to fit the language. Because I guess the rotten attitude I was taking early on was, oh, pff, I don't want to change my content to fit this. But I'm like, it's not about that. It's about just hooking people in. Like you're trying to pull people in from a place that they're hanging at. You want to speak their language. If I want people, oops, sorry. If I want people in France to watch my videos and I show up in Paris and I won't speak French to them, that's idiotic. And that's how I'm trying to look at TikTok, which is to say, you know, what? it's a language and I'm trying to speak their language and I'm trying to translate my content so that they'll want to come hang out with me in my place. And that's, that's all it is. It's not an imposition of my content. It's not watering down the content. It's just learning their language. And it's hard learning language. It's not easy. It takes a lot of time. It takes a ton of practice. Excuse me. could use a little more work, but I think it's almost there. It's getting there for sure. Felix is asking, would it be possible to make a mold of something with that texture? Oh yeah, you, you can pick up hairs if it's a silicone, <laughs> excuse me, rubber mold. The most accurate is silicone, poured silicone, but a waste mold is very good too. Actually, tell me in the chat, who here would like to see me cast a sculpture? It's hard. It's a lot of work, and I don't know that that many people would be that interested in it, but I'm pretty good at it, and I could certainly do that at some point. I mean, we, we would just be doing it for the sculpture nerds. It's, it's not for <laughs> the algorithm, because it, it's such a niche technique that I just don't think it would be a video we would do to get numbers up. It would be a video for all of us sculpture, sculpture dorks. Because I have a lot of different ways I can do molds. In fact, there's one mold I really like. I should do this one. You do it with silicone caulk. That stuff that you put on windows. And it's not a super accurate mold, not even remotely as good as a poured silicone rubber mold, but it's a fast mold. You could make it so quick and so cheap that I think in a particular situation that is more valuable than the poured silicone, which takes forever. And this poured silicone, you can mess it up so bad. It can be really bad. <laughs> Somebody who's done that. So tell me if you want to see mold making, because I can. I can absolutely do that. I just need to know if there's interest because it's a ton of work. It would be a hard stream for me. I would have to have, oh my God, I can't even think about what the camera setup would be for that. I mean, I'd rather shoot it as an edited video, but if I do that, you won't see it for three years. <laughs> just don't have the budget for editors. I'm gonna quickly toss in 
the outline of the toenails because I think it helped me with the big toe to have that like indentation of the toenail. I mean, I don't want it like super detailed, but I just want to have something so it's not just like drawn on the whole time. But we're getting there, that's for sure. Maybe a little in here. Because I'm well aware the sculpture streams are not our famous, not famous, they're not our most pop popular streams, for sure. They're probably the least popular out of the art along pieces. But I'll tell you, when I was in art school and I was trying to find information on how to make molds, I couldn't find it. It didn't exist. I found some in this like very dusty book at the RISD library. It was not helpful. And we did have a wonderful sculpture teacher who taught the figure modeling class and she knew how to do it. But I mean, you, you got to have somebody standing there with you holding your hand. You, you can't remotely fuss it. And so, I don't know, maybe, maybe the internet needs that. Maybe there's a place for that content that we just didn't know existed. So tell me in the chat if that's something you want to see me do. Because it might be helpful. It's just mold making, it's so niche. It's like so few people do it. For a good reason, it's hard. And it's expensive. Like the silicone, the um, if you cast in resin or anything else, it's expensive. So that's another reason it's just not very accessible for most people. It's not really an option. I feel like I'm cutting these toes open. But I need to do it for the toenails. This toe's weird. It's like hiding behind the other one. And this one, the toenail is like really dramatic. It's almost like cutting the toe, right? Ugh, this one looks bad. I got to draw it from, I got to get the right view. Oh, that's okay. I got to cut this move this that way and i gotta add a little more yeah I, I cut off too much let's see if that helps that toe Maybe a little bit more oh my fingers are too fat to do this okay <laughs> It looks a little wonky. <laughs> I think the thing about toenails, though, I mean, I don't think they should be hyper articulate either. I think that they tend to look better when they're just suggested. So you articulate them on some parts, but let them disappear in others. It just looks weird. I mean, unless you're doing like Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, which is all about hyper accuracy in the sculpture, it's really not necessary. JK says, I'd love a super nerdy video on mold making. Very cool. Felix says, there are silicone mold videos on YouTube, but 90% of their objects are smooth and geometrical, nothing too textured. Oh, I guess I have to look. I haven't looked on YouTube to see what's there, but what we might try doing, we could do a baby mold, like a little face like this just so you can see the overview, something simple. And then maybe we could do something, because th this is complicated. This would take like, oh my God, take at least four streams, if not more than that. Chase Louis says, can drawing, can studying sculpture making improve your drawing tools? Absolutely. Chase Louis, for me, sculpture was such a game changer for me. Everything made sense in terms of anatomy after I started doing sculpture. I, I felt pretty decent about my anatomy skills, but it's like, oh my God, everything just popped when I learned the anatomy. Oh, here's another video we could do. Tell me in the chat, who would like this? There is a particular technique 
I'll type it into the chat because the spelling is a little bit strange. It's called an A core J sculpture. An A crochet sculpture is where you sculpt a skeleton, a full figure skeleton, you sculpt the bones, and then you take clay and you sculpt the muscles over the bones. It's really intense. It's something. Maybe there's already a video on it online. I'd have to go see. But if people want me to do that, that is the ultimate anatomy study that I think a lot of people don't typically have access to. It's a very classical technique. But um, see, I was frustrated in graduate school because I took a class just on a crochet. Like that's all we did for the whole class. But the instructor was such a jerk. I couldn't stand him. He was so, oh my God. Matt, he was so weird. This is so bizarre, but he had such an ego problem, but he was also really insecure. I, it sounds like that's not possible, but he would come in and talk about how great he was, but then he would like whine if we didn't get something, didn't understand. I don't know. It was, it was such, he was such a jerk. I couldn't stand him. But uh, yeah, so I, I didn't feel like I really got a good a crochet experience because he just oh my god this guy's such a such a jerk let's see carrie ann says yes it brings skulls back to life cool L says, sounds great. Jill Kama says, incredible. All right, everybody, please join me in the Art Prof Discord. Remember, same as usual, Art Along's channel. Post what you're making, links, whatever you want in there. And it's our first stage session. So you want to go to the Art Along's stage channel. That's what it's called, Art Along's stage you can be in the stage channel and any other text channel at the same time. So you can navigate around to other text channels and you'll still hear the audio in the stage channel, okay? Discord invite link is in the video description. And I'll of course post all this in the Art Alongs channel. So if anybody's lost, <laughs> I'll help you. Don't worry about it. And subscribe to our channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. We would not be here without your incredible support. You are all the motivational boost that we need to keep things up and running and accessible to everybody. Thank you so much for nerding out with me on Sculpture. I will see you next time. Bye.